Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Terry, for all those kind words. I get so embarrassed when he talks like that. <laughs> How many of you know God is good? And all the glory to Jesus. Come on, let's give him glory again. We love you, Lord. And we honor you and praise you. You are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Now, that wasn't too bad. Let's stand up and give him all the glory again. Come on, let's do it. All the glory. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you. We applaud you, Jesus. We lift our hands. We magnify your holy name, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. We honor you, God. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Come on, somebody bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. You are a holy God, a righteous God, a loving God. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I feel better. You may be seated. Praise God. Man is nothing. God is everything. God is everything. Praise the Lord. We had a wonderful time. I tell you, I am so excited to be back in Peckville. I just love you guys, and I love this church, and I love everybody. I love God's people. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, "Uh uh-oh. It's going to be a good service, but you're going to get mad or glad, one of the two. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you tonight that we are... um, in this fortunate position to be in church tonight. Lord, there are so many countries that free religion and and going to church is not allowed. But we thank you, God, that we can come publicly and worship you and praise you and honor you. We thank you, God, we don't take this for granted. We know, Lord, that you're about to move and about to speak to us. And we know that you're about to change lives, Father, and, and most of all, bring us closer to you, God. We honor you, Father, and I ask you to help me to minister the word, and when it comes time for ministry, Father, that you would save, heal, deliver, and set free. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father, we've been asking this for years. I've been coming now, Father, and we believe you for revival, but God, would you this year, would you do it, Father? Would you do a big move, a great move, a breakthrough move in the name of Jesus? Oh, God, you said, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. We don't want to labor in vain, God. We need you. We need your presence. We need your help. So, Father, we pray in unity as a church tonight. And we ask you for revival in Peckville, in Scranton, and Pennsylvania. Move, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Those who believe with me say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, open your Bible tonight, if you would please, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. I want to minister to you prophetically tonight. Is that okay? How many of you believe in the prophetic? God still speaks through people. And I want to speak a little bit about the call, the prophetic. It says here in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, now how many of you believe when God is going to speak to you, you're going to get a revelation? I mean, one word of God will change your whole life. Amen. So God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Say with me the word prophet. A lot of people think being a prophet's a glorious position. You know, it looks admirable, but it's a very tough position. Uh, the prophet is always a head of the regular church. The prophet, God will always show the prophet something. The prophet will come along, share it, and the church would look at him as if he's crazy. 
Hello. He's always a few steps ahead of the people. And then down the line, when things begin to happen, then they'll say, oh, I remember what the prophet said. So the calling of a prophet is kind of a hard call. It's not an easy call. But Jeremiah says to God, verse 6, he says, Allah God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. I'm only a child. I'm young. I remember when I started ministering the Word of God, I got saved. Uh, this year, Shemaine and I are celebrating our 20th year in the ministry, 20 years of being saved and preaching the gospel for 20 years. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. And, uh, you know, for 20 years now, we have seen thousands upon thousands. I believe we're standing at, I don't know, 156,000 people who've given their hearts to Jesus. We've seen over 200,000 people get water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. And uh, uh, I remember when I started preaching, um, I, was, I got saved at 25. And at 25, God started using me. Uh, doing wonderful miracles and stuff like that. And, and I would go into the churches and I would preach a word and many of the people would look at me and say, who's this young guy and what does he know and what experience does he have? And I would pray many times back then. I said, Lord, just give me some gray hair. If I could be grayer, then at least I, you know, I'll get the respect of some, some of the other people, you know, some of the people who would see me. And so I didn't get the gray hair. My wife got the gray hair. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> but uh, I'm going gray a little bit now. But anyway, I was, uh, you know, my age, I was so concerned. I, I was preaching when I was 30 years old, just preaching the word, and, and the fire would fall, and there would still be people looking at me as if, you know, who's this young man? And I understand when, when the prophet said, you know, Jeremiah was only 17 years old when God spoke to him. And he said, Allah God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to Jeremiah, the Lord said to me, verse 7, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. Hallelujah. That's why I stand up here and preach. I can't see too far. That's wonderful. I know. <laughs> you, you know, and Pastor Terry will, will agree with me, but there's a lot of people who can draw funny faces when you preach. You know, they sit there and go. <laughs> Lots of funny things happen up here. I always said one day when I build a church, if God will ever allow me to have a church, I'm going to build a church and up there I'm going to have big mirrors, big mirrors that you can all look at yourself. <laughs> Especially when you worship the Lord, you know, people can see what they look like. And you will have a different worship service the next Sunday, guaranteed. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyway, uh, he says, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. Uh, if anybody wants to know what a prophet does, in three sentences, this is what a prophet does. Number one, to root out and to pull down. Number two, to destroy and to throw down. And number three, to build and to plant. That's why many people don't like the office of the prophet because he comes in or she comes in and God shows them things. They begin to speak. They begin to uh, uh, break things down in the spiritual realm and it feels like all hell breaks loose. Uh, but that's only God coming in to bring cleansing and healing to the situation where the prophet is at. Who understands that? All right, that's what, what happens. But not just that. After what is pulled down, broken, destroyed, removed, then comes the healing. There's always healing that comes where God is. He takes out, but then he brings healing, and he brings restoration, and he repairs things. So this is what God spoke to me when I started ministering 20 years ago. And he said to me that I'm to go into a place, root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, to build and to plant. So I just wanted to give you a warning because tonight's message is entitled, The Fire of Revival. And I'm glad so many of you came. I actually, when we walked in, I said to Terry, I said, I'm amazed. Look how many people came back after this morning's message. Hallelujah. 
And it's good that you are here. And I believe in God that uh, by, by maybe Tuesday night or Wednesday night, we'll be packed out top and bottom. Oh, yeah. Come on. How many of you believe that can happen? It can happen. I know it can happen. God can do it. But what God is doing right now, and I believe that this is a very prophetic time, a prophetic uh, time that we're living in, that God wants to, wants to clean certain things up. You know, a foundation, anybody who understands building, if you, if you build something, you have to lay a foundation. The foundation has to be strong before you can build upon the foundation. How many of you agree? It has to be strong. It has to be clean. You can't just take a foundation that is laid and, you know, some, I've seen this and I'm sure some of you have. They lay a foundation, they run out of money, they can't build on it anymore and then you come back a year later or, or a few months later and the foundation is overgrown, there's weeds and junk on it. So the foundation must be clean before you can build upon the foundation. Hello? And I believe that the Bible says that also that judgment begins in the house of God. Where does it begin? In the house of God. It doesn't begin outside. It begins in the house of God. Why? Because God wants to clean the foundation so that he can build the church. And there's a lot of junk going on in many churches. And that's why growth stops. It comes to a point and stops. And you have to battle, battle, battle. So God has to come do some cleaning up to get you to go into the next level and into the next level. Uh, uh, cleaning the foundation has to be regular. Hello. We have to keep working at it. And God can move. So turn with me, if you would, because I want to bring a prophetic message from the Lord. And I preach this message not just for this church. It is for the body of Christ. In all the churches that I go, I believe that this message is for everybody. So don't think that I'm preaching this message just for this church. It is for the body of Christ. And I know we have visitors from other churches here as well. As well, So it's not um, you know, specifically meant for this church. It's for the body of Christ. Can you agree with me? Amen. Go with me to Ezekiel, if you would, chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. How many of you want to see this church grow and get so big that you'll have to build another bigger one? Wouldn't that be cool if this beautiful auditorium became the youth ministry? Oh boy, you don't sound excited about that. So we just got through one building, you want to do it again. I believe God can give you a 10,000 seater auditorium and pack it out for you as well. How many of you believe God can do that? You can build a 10,000 seater auditorium. Somebody says, that sounds like a lot of work and everything. Of course, it's a lot of work, but God will not give it to you if the church is not ready for it. If, 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 this is a, how many seats can, is it here? 600 or 800? Almost a thousand seater, all right? So if God wants to give you a thousand, seat, uh, a thousand people to fill all these seats, then he needs a strong foundation to maintain those thousand people. Pastor Terry cannot handle everything on his own. How many of you agree? It's tough. I was taught when I was in Bible school, they said that uh, one man can handle 200 people. A pastor is able to handle 200 people. But if you go beyond that, you need help to come in to be able to handle or maintain all the, all the people that are in the church. So every 200 people, you need a pastor to be able to help that. Does that make sense? I don't know. But anyway, and it's so true because you can only handle so much. It's all you can do. So for a church to grow, the people must be ready. Uh, what? We always talk about having extended meetings. I'm all for having extended meetings, but I don't want to do something that, that is man-made. It's got to be God moving. How many of you agree? You know, when we have a, when I speak about we had the four-week revival in our country, we had a nine-week revival two years ago, and, and in this country we've had five-week revivals and so forth and so forth. How, how do you know when it's time to have an extended meeting? Well, uh, this is what I, what I see. Let's say tonight we're about 400 people here or 300 people. Let's say by Wednesday night we have 800 people sitting here. How many of you know that's supernatural? All of a sudden, it's just packed, and there's just this influx of people.
people. This is what happened this year. We were in a church that could also see the thousand, but uh, we started off with 300 people, and by Wednesday night, we were 800 or 900 people, and by Friday night, we were 1,000 people, and that we did for four weeks. We even, we even packed 1,200 people in a building that could only see 1,000. It's fun, I tell you, when you have that. People are sitting on the floor. We had the people, you can look at the pictures on the website, you know, but it, that is a supernatural thing that God does when God just brings it in and revival breaks out. But the point I wanna make is this, that if we do have so many people come in, are you able to handle that? Who makes, does that make sense? What happens in a service, and this we've had, oh, Golly, Shaman, one night, how many demons in the beginning of this year did we have manifest in one service? 40. We had 40 uh, demons manifesting at one time in one service. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> 40 demons manifesting at one time. What will you do if we have a service here and 40 demons begin to manifest at one time, many of you are going to run for the door. Whew, get out. Say, Ooh, I, that's a crazy place. Ah. <laughs> are you ready for a move of God? Are you ready to handle what God wants to do? What happens? All of you looking at me now, you're looking at me with a big question mark. You know, there's the... <laughs> what are you going to do if somebody next to you begins to manifest and demons begin to come out and scream and they begin to punch and fight and do all of these things? A lot of people say, oh man, that can't, that can't happen. It happens. When the anointing of God comes, when Jesus comes on the scene, demons get out of the scene. Hallelujah. They have to go when Jesus comes. And I want to tell you, that's supernatural when God does that. Are you ready? Are you able to handle a demon manifesting next to you? Will you be able to cast it out? Because I've had people come to me, they say, Brother, they want to help. There's a demon manifesting. And another guy says, Help me here. There's, I said, No, no, no. Monkey see, monkey do. I taught you how to do it, do it. I'm not going to do it. You need to do it. Amen. Boy, that's fun. Father, hey, turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you don't have a demon. Because Dion's going to get it. Hallelujah. <laughs> When people sit like this, be aware. <laughs> Somebody says, man, that only happens in Africa. It doesn't happen in America. Oh, there's more demons here than in Africa. Let me tell you that now. It's true. We've cast out lots of demons in America. I like it. Oh, I hope there's somebody has a demon. I hope you have one. Where are you? I want to get you. I'm hungry for casting out demons. Some people say, he's crazy. No, I'm just normal. <laughs> Praise God. The foundation must be ready. What happens if God's anointing is so strong and they bring, you know, you talk about being under pressure when they bring a school of blind people to your service. Do you understand what that means? A school where the blind go? That somebody had so much faith, they put the whole school in a bus and bring them to my services to pray for them to be healed. I, 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 I don't know if you understand. The foundation must be ready. For God to give you a thousand people, he must have a foundation ready for you to handle those thousand people. If God chooses to give 3,000, come on, in the book of Acts, in one day, 3,000 people got saved. A mega church was instantly born. Are you ready for stuff to happen like that? I believe you are. Well, let's read on. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 45 says, Furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards the south, preach against the south, and prophesy against the forest land of the south. And say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, hear the word of the Lord. Come on, help me say it again. Hear the word of the Lord. All right, here it comes. Thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I, that word I is God, obviously not a man, God, I will kindle a fire in you. Are you hearing me? I will kindle a fire in you, and what will this fire do? It shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. So I've asked the Lord when I got this message, I said, Lord, what does this mean? So God said to me, when, I, when people ask for my fire, I'm going to bring in this fire, and this fire is going to touch in other words, if somebody got saved this morning, and if somebody, some of you who got saved 50 years ago, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, God is going to put a fire and start a fire in you. I mean, doesn't matter what position you are, doesn't matter how long you've been saved, how much knowledge you have, how much degrees you have, if you are a child of God, God is going to start a fire in you. Now remember what I said this morning, I said a fire has a double meaning or it's got two functions. Number one, fire, and when I said how many want the fire, everybody said yes, we want the fire. And that's good and all because fire ignites, fire gives energy, fire's power if we understand when we talk about spiritual fire, we want the fire, God uses and do stuff like that. But also fire burns up and destroys, fire removes the junk that shouldn't be there. Does that make sense? It takes it away. And I, I think each and every one of us needs a fire touch from God every now and then. Where we need to come and sit back and we need to evaluate our Christian walk with God and say, Okay, God, am I still on the right track? What is standing between you and I? We need, to, we need to get our priorities right, God. Have I, have I gone over too much in the worldly things and the things of the world, you know, and, and I'm not hearing your voice anymore, I'm not seeing your power, your glory, I'm not experiencing you, then I'd say, Father, send the fire and remove that which is standing between you and I. On the other hand, I evaluate my Christian walk and I say, how many souls have I won for Jesus this week? How many people has the Lord healed? How many people has God set free? Have I witnessed? Have I, have I done this, 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 and that? And if I evaluate myself and say, but hey, you know, I haven't witnessed. I haven't prayed for somebody. I haven't won a soul. Then I say, Father, send the fire. Make me full of your glory, your power. Give me boldness to go and do what I have to do. That's also what the fire does. Amen. So the Bible says, God says, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree, every dry tree in you. That word uh, uh, devour means it will engulf or it will beat voraciously on you. A lot of people don't like that. Watch this. The flame shall not be quenched. In other words, we cannot stop what God wants to do. There's a lot of people trying to stop the move of God, but they cannot stop the move of God. Hallelujah. This flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. In other words, you will be touched by this fire. Now you say, why are you talking like this, Brother Dion? Because before I lay hands on you tonight, I want you to understand you've got to consider whether I want the fire or not. The Bible says don't just quickly go and lay hands, you know, don't lay hands on anybody. You have to consider tonight after I've preaching, you know, after I've taught and I begin to pray, if you say, brother, uh, you say, uh, God, I, I want your fire, then you've got to understand two things are going to happen. One, God's going to move and remove all the junk that shouldn't be there. And that's not fun. And then also he's going to ignite you and put you into a position where he can use you. Amen. All, uh, all flesh, verse 48, all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Then I said, O oh Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? Does he not speak parables? Go with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you ready for the fire? Come on, are you ready? 
Everybody should say, yes, I want the fire. If you're a Christian, we want the fire. All right. I'm speaking prophetically tonight again. Pastor Terry was uh, in the area, him and Fred, when they went down to, to South Africa a few years ago. Uh, we took them up to the place where I got saved in. Do you remember that? Uh, the, the mountain, God's window and all of that. It's, uh, it's just like over here, all these beautiful forests and we have lots of trees and hills and uh, you know, it's just a wonderful place. But there's also, apart from the big uh, forests that we have, there are many hills that have beautiful grass that grows. You know, it's just fields that you can see. And, and um, I, back then, uh, I, I love going, there's an area called God's Window. It's very high. It's 1,776 meters uh, up high, you know. Uh, I don't know what that is in miles or whatever. But it's high. It, you've got this view. You can look, if you're on top of that on a clear day, you can look from there into Mozambique and into different countries, you know. So you've got this huge view, and it's so beautiful. And I used to go and pray there. Uh, that was my prayer place when I got saved. And we, I would go and spend hours upon hours praying up in God's window and on the on the other side where you have this huge view behind it there's the place where all the grass grows that's beautiful uh, in the summer it's luscious green grass and when the wind blows you know the the grass sways like that and it, you know the Bible says that the the grass and the trees worship Jesus the trees of the field will clap their hands and so forth as that psalm says and and uh, I love just to spend time with God then and uh, in the winter time, the grass would go from green to yellow. Who understands that when you get that? And it was so beautiful in the winter time to see that, that dead grass. It's tall grass, but it, it was, if you look with the eye, it's just beautiful. Okay, you get the picture. But the Lord spoke to me and he said to me when I was out there praying, looking at the field, he said to me, what do you see? And I said, Lord, I see a beautiful field. I see the forests around. Uh, uh, I said, Lord, this is your creation. I worship you for your creation. This is beautiful. And the Lord said to me, he said, come back in a few weeks' time. And I want you to come and see again this field. I didn't understand what he meant. And uh, he said he would let me know when to go. Now, Every three years in that area, they would come and burn down the grass. Every time you burn the grass, the seeds that are in the grass would come out and it would produce new grass. And, and, and so the, the forest people would come every three years and burn it. And in that year when the Lord spoke to me, that was the year they went to burn down all these fields and stuff. And uh, I, was, I was at my house and God said, get in your car and go now to the field. And I drove up the mountain and, and I got to my favorite praying place where I was and I looked and the field was gone. It was burned down to the ground, just black. And I sat there looking and the Lord said to me, what do you see? And I said, well, I said, all the beautiful grass is gone. And, and you know what I saw? Then I, I, I saw... Hey, but where the, where the grass was tall, you never saw it. But in that grass, in that field, there were Coke cans and Coke bottles. And there was an old broken down car had been standing there for years. But the grass had covered it up. Who understands what I'm saying? You know, there was junk hidden in the grass, which at a distance in, in the normal time, you would never observe it. But when the fire came all the rubbish stood out. And then the forest people would come and they would clean up the field and take away, you know, all the ugly things that would hurt the eye. And I looked at that and the Lord said, what do you see? I said, that's what I see, God. He said, that is the way the church is. I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, at a distance, the church looks beautiful. At a distance, the church looks, you know, if you look at the church, it looks beautiful. Everybody's worshiping and people go to church and blah, blah, blah. 
But when you, when you really go in and look at the church, there's a lot of junk hidden. Does that make sense? There's a lot of people who are backstabbers. There's a lot of liars in the church. There's a lot of falseness in the church. There's junk everywhere. And the Lord said to me, when you go to these churches or when you go to churches, then you preach my fire because I want to bring fire in the church to get rid of the junk so that the field, the church can be holy, pure, and good in my sight again. I want the fire to take out. Well, when the Lord spoke to me, he gives me the call to America. I don't know if I ever shared with you how I got to this country, but uh, we, Shaman and I, when we, when we went full-time for God, I had two businesses. Financially, we were doing really well. And the call of God came and we got saved and so forth. And Shemaine, Michael was born. The twins were born. Uh, we have three boys, you know. And um, so I'm away preaching at a time. I'm away three weeks to four weeks at a time preaching. Shemaine is running the businesses and she's got three babies to take care of. And both business, one business was in one town, the other business in another town. So you can imagine, ladies, that, you know, trying to run two businesses and take care of the children while dad's away preaching. And I said to God, I said, Lord, listen, you gotta, you got to help me here. Either I'm going to go full-time in the ministry or I'm going to continue running the businesses, but I can't do both. It's, it's too much. And I said, show me what you want me to do. And the Lord spoke to me, and it's a long story, but I, obviously I went full-time in the ministry. But my deal with God was this. If I go, my wife and my children go with me. I don't want to go on my own. And Lord, where they go, you'll provide for us. Up to that day until now, I've never, ever, ever put a demand on the church for finances. I've never asked for money. Hello. Is that true, Pastor? Never asked for finances. I believe that where we go, God will provide for us and he'll meet our need. But besides that, you know, this is how we started going in. So Shemaine and I, we, we got to a point where I sold my house we sold everything. We just got rid of everything, the businesses, and we went. All we had was a van, and, and for five years, we did not even have a house. We stored all our furniture in a Sunday school classroom at a church, and for five years, ladies and gentlemen, we went on the road with nothing, just the van. When we got to a place like here, the place we got to, that church became our house, and the people there became our family. And that's the only life that we've known for the last 16 years is just preaching like that. So driving from one town to the next town, we were in, on, the, on the west coast of our country by the sea. And, and in that part of our country is very poor people, fishermen's villages. You know, and we were up there preaching. And um, I, I was driving in our van. The boys were behind sleeping. Shemaine is next to me. And in my car is my prayer closet. Because we spend so much time driving, you know, I, I pray a lot. And as I'm driving, God speaks to me. And I know this sounds, you know, dodgy or some people say that. But God, I believe, spoke to me in an audible voice. I heard his voice as clear as you hear my voice. And he said to me, I'm driving. He said to me, I'm sending you to America. And I'm driving, and I said, oh, no, <laughs> not America. I'll go anywhere but America. Uh, you, some of you would say, but why? You know, well, back then, America is the country that teaches and does the best. Hello, we, we as South Africans, we sing the music, you know, of America, and we, we have the teachings of the Americans and the Bible schools and the blah, blah, blah. You know, what do I have to give the American people? That was my fear. There's nothing I can give you. But the Lord said to me, I'm sending you to America to do two things. Number one, to stir my people up again. And number two, to bring back the true anointing. And I didn't understand that. I said, the true anointing. I said, Lord, if I put on the TV, I see anointing, you know. I see God moving. I see miracles. I see these huge auditoriums, people getting healed and, and stuff happening. And the Lord said, that's not the only thing. You need to go and look at what's going on in America. Okay, so this is why we are here. And the Lord spoke to me uh, driving in the car. I turned to Shemaine and I said to Shemaine, I said, Shemaine, the Lord just spoke to me and he's sending us to America. 
And she said, mm, that's nice, and that was it. We didn't speak anymore. I'd been to Russia, I'd been to Ukraine, I'd been up in Africa, I'd preached a lot of different countries, but America was something strange for us to go to. Uh, not that I didn't want to come, I was fearful to come to this country because of the, this great nation. So we didn't speak one word, nothing. When I got to this next little village where we were preaching at, on the, on the Tuesday night, I got a telephone call four o'clock in the morning and the Lord spoke, uh, I mean, a, a person phones me from from Texas, Waco, Texas. A friend of mine who had been in my services some time ago, and they were in, in Texas, and this guy said, hey, Brother Dion, are you still preaching as much as you do? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, listen, we are here in Waco, Texas, and if you ever feel the urge to take a vacation, you know, and to stop, then we want you to come uh, and have a vacation here in America. Now, remember, the Lord spoke to me on Saturday. This is Tuesday. I'm getting a phone call four o'clock in the morning. Somebody from America is inviting me to go there. Does that make sense? How many of that's God? You know, and I'm saying, man, is this real? And, but I said, well, thank you very much. I took his number and we left it at that. I didn't pray about it. We didn't speak about it. Nothing. We didn't tell the church. I didn't tell the pastor. Shemaine and I never mentioned America again. Well, at the end of that week, we did Sunday through Friday, and this is a very small, itty-bitty church. I'm not lying. You know, if you pray for somebody, they fall down, their head lies by the back door. You know, <laughs> that's how small it is. <laughs> so we had an awesome break. Really, God did move, and it was wonderful, and, and the service was over, and the pastor had done the, you know, the last prayer, and, and the people were already standing up about to walk out of the church, and the pastor, all of a sudden, he just stops, and he yells. He says, wait, wait, stop, stop, everybody stop. And um, he says, God just spoke to me. So everybody comes back into the church, they sit down, and this is what the pastor says. God spoke to me, and God said that we must right now take up a love offering for Dion and Shemaine. They have to go to America. Hello, my hair went, and I'm looking, and I said, how did he know that? You know, I didn't tell him nothing. We, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I thought, you know, old Doubting Thomas, I said, this little itty-bitty church, they could never take up enough money to pay for our air tickets. And lo and behold, guess what happened? They took up an offering. It was enough money right to the scene to buy two air tickets for Shemaine and I to go to America. And this is how we got to this country, okay? So three days, I mean, God spoke to me Saturday. I got the phone call uh, Tuesday. Friday, I've got money. The next week, we went back to Johannesburg. And in that same week, we got passports and visas and air tickets. And three weeks later, boom, here we were in America. I just decided, that's it. I'm going to have a break and go to America. <laughs> Praise God. So we come to this country, and I was freaked out because when you come to this country, you people drive all on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> And the, and the steering wheel is on the wrong side, you know. And I mean, I was kicking in front and holding the windscreen, and the, this, the, <laughs> it was petrifying. But we got, and we drove from Dallas all the way to Waco, and that was the longest drive I ever had, you know, driving on the wrong side. And, and um, we get there, and I remember as we drove into Waco, there were all these churches. I'll never forget it. You drive down the main road. Here was the first Baptist church. Across it was the second Baptist church. In the next corner was the third Baptist church. Hallelujah. Then it was the first Methodist and the second Methodist. Then going a little bit further was the Church of God, the Church of the Nazarene, and the Church of Christ. And then there was the Presbyterians. Hello. And then there were, I said, bless God, revival is in this place. Hallelujah. There are so many churches they church possessed, bless God. Really, I just thought, man, this is beautiful. You know, look at all these churches and, and these buildings and so forth. And we got to, uh, to the people that we're going to stay at. This was on, on, a, on the Tuesday that we were there or the Wednesday. And then on Thursday, this friend of ours, he said, he said, Brother Dion, I made an appointment with our pastor, and uh, I want you to meet him uh, on, on the Thursday. And I said, well, that'll be nice, you know. And, and so we go the next day to the pastor of this big church. I mean, there's a, they were a thousand-member church. And 
we went in, sat down, and in his office, you know, and, and that this is my first, my first meeting with an American minister. We sat down, and we were just, you know, having casual talk, and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm a minister evangelist, and God uses this in healing and so forth. And, and um, as we were talking and sharing, the pastor says this. He says, Brother Dion, I just feel in my spirit that God wants you to minister this Sunday night. How about it? He said, will you preach Sunday night? I said, Pastor, you don't know me. He says, I have the witness of God in me, and I want you to preach Sunday evening. I said, well, you know, um, I did really. I packed one, one suit in. So I said, hey, I packed a suit, and I came prepared. I knew the Lord said I'm going to come and preach it. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So my friend, he takes out an old video, and he says, Pastor, watch this. He puts the video in, in the thingy then, and there's me preaching. I didn't even know that some church was at the head of video made of me. And on this video was healings like you saw this, you know, on the video this morning. Somebody paralyzed, get up and walk and blah, blah, blah. And the pastor got so excited. He said, Dion, he said, I don't do this, but will you do Sunday morning service? Now, how many of you know that a minister doesn't just give his pulpit to a stranger? Is that right? Just like Terry said, you don't do that. And I looked at him, I said, are you sure you want me to preach Sunday morning? He said, oh, yes. Oh, I just feel this is what you must do. I said, okay, if that's what you want me to do. I came to have a three-week vacation, but, you know, that's fine. I'll come and minister. So this is how I get introduced to America. Is everybody with me? Come Sunday morning. Because we left the past and, you know, we were visiting with our friends. Come Sunday morning, this is what happens. This is a beautiful church, just like this. had also the balcony and everything. And, and the building was packed out with people. There was cars outside. The service started at 11 o'clock. And uh, we got there, you know, at about uh, uh, 10.30. We got to the church. And I'll never forget, and I hope you're listening because this is part of the teaching tonight. Uh, we get to this church, and uh, the building is kind of like a round building with all the glass doors outside, and there's like five or six entrances that you can go in. And we, I've got my suit on, and Shemaine is dressed, you know, and we walk into, this, into the foyer area, and there was, I open the door, and as I walk in, there are these greeters, you know, the ushers. But what I noticed was, and I liked it, that... All the ushers had green jackets on, you know, black pants and ties, really smart looking. I like that. I like the ministry of excellence. Does that make sense? I like it. It looked good. But this is the problem, though. The, well, not the problem. Uh, oh, I, I also noticed that on every person who had a green jacket, there were a lot of, I call them green jackets, you know, there are a lot of people with green jackets, and they all had a name plate on. It wasn't Joe or Peter or something. What was written on the name tag was the word intercessor. All right? Intercessor. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, walk in, it doesn't say what the name is, just intercessor. But here's the bad thing. I remember when we walked in, normally when people greet you, how many of you know they greet you, hi, welcome, but when we walked in, this man came and this is what he did. He looked at Shemaine and I like this. And you know, I kind of, something, what's wrong with me, you know? He didn't smile. He didn't do nothing. He said, you know, because there's the point in the church doors. He said, please go on in there. And I thought, well, that's kind of ill-mannered. You know, that's not very nice. I didn't feel very welcome coming in. And we went into the church, and here yeah, the place is packed out. It's people everywhere, and there's a nice vibe, you know, nice buzz going in the church. And, and the pastor, he was down here. He saw Shemaine and I walk in, so he comes up. He takes Shemaine, has a sit down, and he's, come on, uh, Brother Dion, quickly, let's go into my office. And so I went down into his office, and he said, listen, the intercessors are praying. Let's go in there and go and pray with them a little bit. I said, that's fine. So I walk in to where the intercessors are. 
Now, I understand intercessory prayer. I understand what we would call giving birth in the spirit. Who understands that of an intercessor? I believe in that. I'm for that. I've experienced that. But when I walked into this prayer room, there were about 200 intercessors, maybe less, 150 green jackets. And when I walked in there, it felt like I walked into another world. A madhouse. There were people on the floor groaning, and there was one not giving birth to one baby. I think she was giving birth to triplets or something. I don't know. I mean, it was crazy. There were people in the corner. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand manifestations. Are you with me? I'm for that. I like it. But this was, whoa. I, man, Lord, I thought I knew something, but so I just went and I hid in the corner. I just said, I said, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, why am I here? Why am I here? Does anybody understand that? You know, I just, boy. I, and I knew God had put me there, obviously, too. Anyway. So <laughs> after they all prayed, you know, and like 10,000 babies were born and all of these things were happening, <laughs> the, the pastor gets them all together and he stops and there was the head intercessor, okay? She was a lady of 50 years of age, uh, a short lady, really good looking lady. I'm not lying, she was, she was a, a strong world lady, you know, and, and um, the pastor got everybody together and, they, and he said to them, this, he said, hey, I never told you guys but we have Brother Dion Hockey from South Africa, and he's going to be ministering this morning. And you know, instead of people saying, oh, that's nice, they, I had 150 people go, <laughs> I'm not lying. The head intercessor just kind of, you know, she checked me out, and, and she said to the pastor, why didn't you tell us, and why didn't you warn us that we can pray about this, you know, and everything? And he said, oh, well, too bad, you know, I've done what God told me to do. So we go out after the prayer meeting, and I was so glad because we go out and, and we walk up the platform in this big old church. Uh, in our country, uh, you must understand, it's not customary for us to sit on the platform like this morning, you know. We don't do that. So to get out on the platform and sit there, whoa, that's scary. Because you have everybody looking, who's he? What's he doing? He's right right me. It's like you're being put on a thing, you know, being displayed or something. I don't know. I, thank goodness, Terry, we're sitting down there. <laughs> but it, it's, un, you know, for us, it's not usual. And so there we were sitting, and the church, just like this one, two, three, four sections up top there, uh, the church is full. But in that section, that row, there were 200 seats that were marked with big old uh, coverings that says intercessor, intercessor. So that was the intercessor section, okay? Just them to sit there. And I'm not lying. When the music played, it was wonderful. Everything was good. But 200 intercessors were looking intently at me. And I felt uncomfortable. That morning, to make a long story short, I started preaching, shared my testimony. And that morning, the Lord healed 40 deaf people in the church. Hallelujah. 40 deaf people were touched by God's glory. God, he said to me, he said, Brother Dion, will you preach tonight again? I said, sure. And so to make a long story short, what was supposed to be one service turned out to be a three-week revival meeting that God started doing things. People came from everywhere, and God started moving. This is how I came to America. But in this time, I want to share this with you. This is important. In this time of this revival, I, I'm... You know, I pick up things in the spirit, and I see certain things. For instance, when we were singing and worshiping God, everybody was singing, praising the Lord, but the intercessors were worshiping God extravagantly. Does that make sense? You know, they were doing things really wildly. Nothing wrong with that, but, you know, they were kind of like, liking to have the spotlight on them. And then, just like tonight, we had people speak in tongues, you know, or somebody gave an interpretation or a prophetic word. Uh, every night, 
when we would worship in the spirit, and, and I love that, uh, there would be people who would, you know, speak out in tongue, then would come the interpretation. You know what I mean. I mean, I love stuff like that to happen because I know God speaks like that. But what I noticed was every night was just the intercessors speaking in tongues and prophesying. The church was a little bit quiet. And I said, okay, Lord, what's going on here? In the second week of the revival, I love to hear testimonies. How many of you like to hear testimonies on what God's doing during the service, you know? And every night, I would give an opportunity and say, all right, you know, before I minister, last night we witnessed God do wonderful things. Who would like to share a testimony on what God has done? And, you know, I would look at this church packed out with people, and every time I said, who would like to give a testimony, the green jackets would stand up and come down to the front. And the green jacket would take the microphone, and they would, you know. I call them the airy, fairy, spiritual, scary. <laughs> Who knows what I mean by airy, fairy, spiritual, scary. Oh, stay away from them, I'm telling you. And they would come up and they would, thus saith the Lord God, and they would prophesy and do all of that stuff, you know. Nobody in the audience, you know, the church people, nobody would come and give testimony. And I was kind of getting, not, it's not upset, but frustrated. Why is it just the green jackets? Does that make sense? They were like dominating the church. So in the third week of revival now, I said this. I said, is there anybody who will come and tell me what God did for you in this week apart from the intercessors? <laughs> and all the intercessors, <laughs> you know, they looked at me. I said, no, is there anybody else? And in the audience, way back in a little hand went up like that. And I said, oh, yes, thank you, Jesus. I said, please, come, come and tell me. And a little Hispanic lady, this big, she comes walking down the aisle to, towards me. And I, she came to come and share a testimony, okay? So she walks down the aisle, and I'm not lying. As she walks down, her eyes are not looking at me. She's looking at the intercessors. <laughs> and I said, look at me. I said, Shh, don't look at them. Look at me. Come, 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 come. Stand here by me. <laughs> So this lady gets on the platform, and you could see these people. They were just, you know, checking her out, saying, wow, what has she got that we don't have, you know? Is she better than us and all of this stuff? And I'm holding the microphone, and I stand like this, so that she can't see the intercessors. I think, come on, speak. So she says, Brother Dion, she said, I've been listening to your teaching, and I like what you say, monkey see, monkey do. I like that, she said. And do you know, she says, today I was in Walmart. I said, really? She said, yes. And as I went shopping today, and I've been here every night listening to you preach, she said, I went to Walmart, and in Walmart there was a lady in a wheelchair. You know, not those scooters, a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. And I, I heard your voice that you said we must pray for the sick and do all of this. And she said, I went to this lady and I said to this lady, I said, lady, do you know that Jesus loves you? And then this, you know, this little Hispanic lady speaking and, and the lady said, yo, yes, I know that. She said, do you know you don't have to be in this wheelchair, but Jesus can heal you and help you right now. And the lady in the wheelchair said, oh, I believe that. She said, can I pray for you right now that Jesus can heal you? And the lady said, we're in Walmart. She said, oh, it's okay. Jesus is in Walmart also. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> So the lady said, yes, if you would like to, pray for me. So this little Hispanic lady says, Brother Dion, I watched you, and I did the same. I put my hand on her head, and I said to the devil, devil, come out in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, she says, this lady started standing up, and she was healed in Walmart by the power of God. Hallelujah. God did a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. Well... Just like you responded now, people clapped hands except the 200 in the scissors. There was the, oh. When she said that, another person jumps up. And I said, 
can I say something? I said, come on, come on. And all of a sudden, people started jumping up and people started sharing testimonies on how they would get people saved, how the Lord used them in healing, how God did financial miracles. And all of a sudden, the genuine testimony started coming forth. Does that make sense? Not just somebody, you know, trying to get a show and trying to look good. People were sharing what God had done for them. And I was so excited at hearing what God was doing through the body of Christ. But the head intercessor and the other intercessors were angry. I mean, they didn't like that at all. And then we were coming to the end. I had to fly back to South Africa. Shemaine comes to me and Shemaine says to me, do you know what? I said, what? She says, that head intercessor. I said, what about her? He said, she is in an affair. She's in a relationship with another man. I said, really? She said, yeah, I felt the Lord showed me that. I said, well, yeah. so why are you telling this to me? She said, I don't, you've got to do something about it. I said, I... <laughs> <laughs> now, you've got to understand something. This head intercessor lady, really a nice lady. You know, when you talk to them and you look at them, they look really spiritual. Does that make sense? I mean, golly, they can quote the word and they can pray up a storm and everything and... and uh, you know, when you have a thousand people attending the service and you begin to call people out, you know, and I want to lay hands on a thousand people or pray for, you know, it takes time to minister to people. How many of you understand that? I don't just do a little prayer and say, okay, God bless you, go home. I, I want to minister to people, but when you have so many people, you need help. So but there were times that I would call the pastor of this church. I would call him and say, hey, pastor, come and help me, please. There's too many people to lay hands. I want you to help me lay hands and minister. And then every time when I would minister, I'd have Shemaine stand with me and minister. And so when I called the pastor, I said, pastor, you and your wife, please come and lay hands and minister. How many of you believe that's the correct thing to do? And so the pastor's wife, oh my goodness, she was a quiet lady just, you know, sitting in the audience, minding her own business and uh, not really getting very involved. And so when I said, pastor, please come and help to pray and bring your wife with, his wife came and they would pray. But the head intercessor, listen to this, she would come and stand behind the pastor and his wife and she would lay hands on them and she would intercede for them, do all of these things. Do you, who understands what I'm saying? You know, it's a, and, and she would get so spiritual that she would wiggle her way in between her her husband and the wife, she would get in between them and she would very politely shift the pastor's wife out of the way. Does that make sense? I noticed the thing called the Jezebel spirit. Who knows what the Jezebel spirit is? The one who loves the attention. The one who always wants to be heard and always wants to say something and always want to do something. They want to be seen. And so I got fed up with this after about the third or second night. And I went to this lady. I said, listen. I said, I said, the pastor and his wife are to lay hands. I didn't tell you or give you the right to lay hands. She said, what do you mean? I said, I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how you are called of God. I did not ask you to lay hands. I said, the pastor and his wife. So please go and sit down and pray there if you want to. Boy. That lady did not like me at all. <laughs> Nothing. She did not like me at all. How many of you know we need to learn to submit? Now, you've got to hear what I'm saying. We need to learn to submit. And what I've noticed in the years going on now, there's a lot of people who want to do their own thing and they don't want to submit. A lot of people think I am called of God. I have this great anointing. I am more anointed than what my pastor is. My pastor is just a pastor. He is not an evangelist. He doesn't prophesy. He doesn't pray. He doesn't lay hands on the sick. I am better than he is. So what I do is I come and I push my will on other people. I had this in my services many times that when I would come to preach or when I minister, if demons begin to manifest or something and if I don't give the, the go-ahead or if the pastor of the church doesn't give the go-ahead to somebody else, then people just interfere and begin to lay hands and do things. You're not allowed to do that. It's my service, not yours. 
If I go to Benny Hinn's meetings and God begins to move and things happen, I would sit there and if a demon would manifest right next to me, I'd God bless them. I'm not going to lay hands on them. I'm not going to do anything because it's not my service. I am there to submit and to learn. Who's with me? Does this make sense? Now, before I finish my story, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because this is important. I'm talking about the fire of revival. Say with me, fire. Fire. Again. All right. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, how does one lay the foundation of Jesus Christ? The answer, to get salvation, to be born again. How many of you agree? The day you give your life to God, Jesus becomes your foundation. Is that true? doesn't matter whether you're a Methodist, Presbyterian, or whatever church you come from. Uh, if you've given your heart to Jesus, that's the foundation. Can you agree? Now he says, this is important, verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw. Now that's important. He goes from the most precious gold down to what looks like the least straw. And again, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what does this mean from gold to straw and all these different kinds of of, of, uh, uh, metals and stuff? The Lord said to me, And this is for you as well. Doesn't matter how many degrees, how anointed, and how well equipped you are, whether you have this gold ministry of being an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, you know, whether you're a home cell leader or a Sunday school teacher, uh, no matter who you are, if you're the one who vacuums the church's uh, carpets and you clean the toilets, from the highest to the lowest, does that make sense? All right, so God's word is for everybody, young and old, mature and immature. doesn't matter who you are, okay? Now listen to what he says. Now if anyone builds on this foundation, all of you who say I'm a Christian started building on the foundation, Jesus, with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw. Verse 13, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is you say what does that mean well let's go on if anyone's work was 14 which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And I'll explain to you everything I'm saying here. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. All right. What does that mean? When we talk about the fire revival, when God comes and God says, I'm going to kindle a fire in you. I'm going to start a fire in you. What God is saying tonight, and I'm speaking prophetically, is that God is going to come and put you to the test. And he's going to test you to see what kind of foundation you have and what you've been building. Have you been building your own kingdom or have you been building God's kingdom? Are you about your own business, your own, your own selfish ambitions and so forth, or are you busy with God's things? Are you following me? The, I say this, many people went... And were not sent. A lot of people say, I have the call of God in my life. You do? Oh, yes. A lot of people walk around handing out their own little business cards. I'm a prophet. Phone me if you need me. (laughs) It's amazing how many people have their own business cards. They like to promote themselves. They like to be under the spotlight. They like to hear the praises of man. Oh, you didn't hear me. 
bishop, first lady of what? Oh boy, I'm going to make some people mad now. They like the title prophet, apostle. Don't, don't speak to me as pastor, you call me apostle. Apostle of what? I know of ministers in this country and my country who have had the same church with the same 20 people who's been preaching that in that church doing the same thing for 20 years and he's not pastor, he is now apostle. Really. I've heard people say, I'm a prophet. Just because I spoke in tongues and prophesied, now I'm a prophet. You are? Oh, I hope you hear what I'm saying now because the devil doesn't like what I'm saying. You see, there are many people who have self-appointed themselves. And they think that they are called of God, but they are not called of God. And if they are called of God, they run ahead of God and they bring destruction in the church. And that's why we have so many towns, just like this one, and all over the world, my country, your country, that little towns of, of 10,000 people have 20 or 30 churches in it. They have a church in the garage, a church in the tree house, a church behind the, you know, they have churches everywhere, and these churches are only have 10, 20, 30 people max. That's it for the last 10 years. Oh, he was an ear, let him hear. And these people who once went to a church, they submitted under the pastor, and then they thought, hey, I'm better than the pastor, he's not doing, so I'm going to go, and I'm going to start my own church. They break away in the spirit of rebellion. And they weren't sent of God or told God to do that. They did it thinking they're better than what the pastor of the church is. Oh, I hope you're hearing me. And what makes me scared about things like this is that when people like me come to a town and we have special meetings, you have all these breakaway people come to the services and they begin to manifest in a religious way. I've had people come to me and say, Brother Dion, can I make an appointment? I want to see you. I say, do you belong to the church? They say, oh, no, 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 no. Well, you just want to talk to you. I said, no, I'm not interested in the way you want to talk to me and talk ill about the pastors of this town. I don't care. You didn't hear what I just said. A lot of people want me to counsel them and minister to them because the pastor of the church is not spiritual enough. Oh, but you're the man of God. You're spiritual enough. A lot, you say, what are you telling me, Dion? There's a lot of people who are building their own ministries. It's not successful. They prophesy people out of your church. Take their money. Hey, oh, the Lord says, if you will come to my church and if you will pay your tithe into my church, the Lord says, within three months, you will have millions. Submission is a very, 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 very important thing in the, in the local body of Christ. And if you cannot pass the test of submission, you'll never be successful out there. Oh, you can say you're successful, and you can have your building, and you can have your 20 people there, but you'll never get beyond that point of growing. Who understands what I'm doing here? You see, this, this head intercessor was not in it for God's glory. I believe she started off in the right manner, but then she liked how people would come and praise her and pat her on the back and say, oh, what a mighty woman of God you are. You're so anointed and you can, you can prophesy so accurately. And so you get the people begin to develop this big fat head. And they begin to, you know, walk around and, and, and if they don't get the recognition they want, they, they think of themselves more highly than other people. I know God better than you do. I hear God's voice and you don't. And they begin to dominate over people. Does that make sense? And then when the fire of God comes and when revival begins to break out, guess what God does? God says, I'm up to here with these people. It's time for me to cleanse the house. 
It's time for me to take out the people that shouldn't be there and put the people in that should be there. The Lord spoke to me this many years ago. The Lord said to me many years ago, he said, the somebodies are going to become nobodies and the nobodies are going to become somebodies. Because many people went and were not sent. Many people did their own thing and God was not in it. Does that make sense? So when Shemaine said to me, this head intercessor, she's in adultery, I, I, I said, okay, Lord, what must I do? So I went to the pastor of the church and you, you got to understand, this man looked up to this woman. Come on, I mean, the spiritual. And I said to the pastor, I said, pastor, you're most probably not going to like what I say and you most probably won't believe what I'm saying, but your head intercessor is in adultery. She's having a relationship with one of her disciples. They had lots of disciples. And I said, she has a relationship with her disciple. And the pastor looked at me and said, oh, no, you're wrong. She'll never be like this and never be like that. You see, the, the devil knows how to disguise himself behind a religious spirit. Does that make sense? Hello. We've got to be very careful. So anyway, we finished up, and I went back home to South Africa, and I hadn't heard from that church for a long time, a few weeks, and I got an email from one of my friends that were in that church, and they said, Brother Dion, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what? He said, uh, in the email, he said, do you remember the head intercessor? Uh, she and her disciple, she's 50, he was 21, they eloped and ran away. She left her husband just like that, and they out of it. That big old church that was in a big move and revival, there was just a, the church went down because God started exposing certain things. Who hears what I'm saying? Now, the point of this whole teaching, the fire of revival, is God wants us to be pure and holy before Him. Hello? We, God uses holy, pure vessels. Not people who manipulate the system, but God wants to use the right people. Quickly write this down if you are interested. There's five things that happen when the fire of God hits a church, when revival comes. You must understand these five things. I'm warning you ahead of time. Number one, when revival comes, when the fire comes, it seems like there's a split in the church. Now, when I say split in the church, there's some people who leave. And this is not a split in the church. This is God separating the chaff from the wheat. Hello, are you hearing what I'm saying? This is God removing certain elements to have the Spirit to go continue flowing. Hello? It's not a split. It's God cleaning the foundation. It's God putting new wine into old wineskins, and the old wineskins tear because they cannot handle the new wine. Hello, new wine, new wineskins. Old wineskins tear. Why does the wineskin tear? Because it's full of sin and corruption. So the first thing that happens is there comes a separation. Secondly, when the fire of God comes, judgment will come through the preaching of the word. Just like I'm talking tonight, this morning. Some people say, that's a hard message. You're preaching too hard. You're beating me over the head. No, 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 no. It's God bringing judgment and correction. Hello, somebody. We've got to live a holy, pure life. A lot of people don't want to hear the truth anymore. Thirdly, great repentance will take place. Hello? People repent. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Help me. This is what happens. Fourthly, leadership will be removed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God takes out the people that shouldn't be there and he puts in the people that must be there. Leadership will be removed. When I came to this country, I tell you, I was just amazed at how we got into churches. There's a specific church, I won't say it was an Assembly of God church, believe it or not big church. And in this church, when I got there, 
they had a, a hundred member choir singing. I mean, a hundred member, all robes and big old TV screens, and they had a band. Oh, Pastor, you would have loved that, a whole full orchestra. They had violins and brass section. It was wonderful. This church, it, was, it looked so good. Uh, when the pastor would get on, he, he, th- this church, the platform, just like this, had big old curtains. Can you imagine that? The stage was closed with curtains. And then the band and everybody was there, and we would come up through the back, and we would sit down, and the pastor would pick up his telephone. The curtains are shut. The people are out there, and he would, the, there was a music conductor in front. He would look at the conductor, and he would nod his head, pick up the phone, and he would phone the people in the back, and they said, begin. And I'm not lying when he said begin. It's like on a CD player, you push the play button. It just, the show began. A show. The curtains went, and the choir began to sing. It was just like playing a CD. Most beautiful music, ever, but no anointing, no presence of God. How many remember that old song we used to sing? Celebrate Jesus. They sang that sitting down. I'm the only one saying, ha, ha, ha. Everybody's sitting. Uh. We need the fire. We need to say, God, help me, Lord. If there is anything that is not of you, I pray the fire that you would burn out, remove, take away, that I can be pure and holy, a vessel of honor that you can work through. How many of you receive what I'm saying? I want the fire, Lord. I want you to, to change me. I don't want to be an obstacle for your kingdom. I don't want to walk around with my own spotlight on my head. I want to be truly be used of you. How many of you received the message I'm giving tonight? Amen.